God, our Father, again, we bow before your throne of grace to praise your holy name. Thank you for all that you are and all that you do. Thank you for these dear friends, and thank you for this opportunity to serve you in this manner. Uh, bless our efforts and uh, be with us as we go about the project. In Christ's name I pray. Nelson would give his whole seminar to one person, and he wouldn't be doing it grudgingly. He would be excited that this one person is now learning the truth about what those bankers are doing and how he can free himself from their grip. There's really, I don't know anyone else like him. Like he's, he's a character, you know, there's, a, he's, he's Nelson. And once you know him, you say, okay, that's possible. That sort of person can exist now, but you didn't know that before you met the guy. Any questions, Nelson, before we? Yeah, where do we start? I'm like a, uh, a mosquito in a nudist colony. <laughs> I know what to do, <laughs> well, where do you start? The men and the women that would, that would change things are, are people with, with common sense and, and character and courage, you know, courage to be able to tell the truth, you know, in front of anybody. And to me, that described Nelson Nash to me. Yeah. All right, good and ready. Let's do it. We go over to Nelson's house, and he'd be in the office, you know, on the computer typing. As a, and what he was doing is receipts for for orders. He'd get a phone order, so he'd order one book. He'd uh, process the order. He'd, he'd type it, a word document, a receipt, thanking him for the order, and you know, kind of like sharing a little bit of wisdom with him. And so it took him about an hour to process one order. Yeah, approximately. And, uh, but it, it was definitely, it was definitely a personal message for every single one of them though. Please welcome FEE President Larry Reed. Thank you very much, Roger. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's my privilege tonight to bestow our Blinking Lights Award upon an extraordinary gentleman. I love this guy. His name is R. Nelson Nash. Nelson Nash is the discoverer and the developer of the infinite banking concept and the author of the book, Becoming Your Own Banker. In that book, he describes the power of dividend-paying whole life insurance and the financing capabilities that it presents for policy owners. But that description doesn't do full justice to this extraordinary idea that Nelson has developed and promoted. It truly is one of the most personally liberating tools of the last half century. But more than a financial innovator and educator, Nelson is nearly a lifelong advocate of the Austrian School of Economics, so important to fee in our history, free markets, and sound banking. It was more than half a century ago that Nelson became acquainted with Leonard Reed and fee. He's been one of our most faithful cheerleaders and supporters ever since. Untold thousands of people have been introduced to fee and these principles by Nelson, the books he's written, and the events and programs that he has sponsored, always with the help and support of his lovely wife, Mary, at his side. Nelson and Mary, will you please come forward? Periods of uh, introspection are extremely important. 30 years ago today, I was in Brookwood Hospital over here, getting replumbed in the heart four times. Went to bed about two o'clock in the morning. I woke up with a rumbling in here. There was no uh, chest pain. There was no pain shooting down my arm that people talk about, stuff like that. But there was nausea. Yeah. You ever picked up a sack with a cat or a snake or something like that and feel it moving around in there? That's what it felt like. Anyway, uh, it was so incidental, I just laid there for a while. And uh, finally said to myself, hey boy, something wrong. Yeah. 
Got me down to Brookwood uh, Hospital, couldn't find anything wrong with me. Found a cardiologist uh, on duty uh, that uh, afternoon about five or six o'clock. Uh, gave me the heart cast and said, you have four block 90% and you're right on the verge of a massive one. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm coming out of anesthesia. Well, you see the uh, inspiration uh, for uh, the concept had begun to, uh, at least five years before that. Mm -hmm. And I tried to suppress it. How do you explain this sort of stuff to the mindset that prevails out there? And I kind of tried to suppress it. Uh, but uh, when I had that uh, bypass and so forth, uh, it was about like a two or four across the eyes. Uh, <laughs> Look, boy, I planted something in your head bone and uh, it needs to be uh, revealed. Uh, get your tail up and go to work. Now, I have to admit that first 10 years was a monster. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't fun at all. Yeah. You know, I was trying to get the message done to, uh, through uh, uh, seminars with local people and so forth. And you, uh, get about uh, 40 people that uh, are good suspects here and let's say 30 of them uh, what, what not is going to be uh, promising they're going to be there. All right, six o'clock on Thursday night. Four o'clock, uh, I start calling them all to remind them. Every last one of them said they're going to be there. And there were several occasions where no one showed up. I'm trying to think of a word. Disheartened is not one of them. It's not strong enough. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's why are you doing this, boy? I guess so, something like that. Yeah. No, I was teaching, quote, the book uh, years before the book ever came out. Mm -hmm. I was using overhead projectors and slides and uh, handouts and stuff like that. Back in my equitable days, the big meeting was always uh, spring of the year. And invariably, uh, I got to be on a panel. I always had these panels. Well, there's three people in the panel always, and a moderator. Well, you've got a maximum of 15 minutes to talk. Well, by the time you get through with the trivia stuff that goes on, uh, you know, just in those gatherings, uh, you probably got 12 minutes max to try to make a point. Now you go ahead and try to explain infinite banking concepts in 12 minutes, yeah? It's <laughs> There's no way. It's yeah, how do you even explain the word infinite? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, that uh, was my frustration. And, so uh, I was trying to get the message done as I saw it uh, over a two and a half hour period of time. It went right over everybody's heads. No, uh, no response at all to speak of. Anyway, that was the experience that uh, led me to um, realize that I was trying to get too much done in too short a period of time. It didn't give people a chance to digest the information. No way. Coupled with the fact that this is different from the way people think. Well, how do you change them, the way people think when they've been fully indoctrinated all their life with a, a pattern? Right. So uh, getting that uh, whole thing changed is a very, very difficult thing. You've got to go back and get totally re reprogrammed or whatever. So I saw that I had to rework uh, the course, rewrite it. Let's talk about introspection a little bit more, mm -hmm. all right? How important that is. Remember that I'm a forester, and during those nine years of uh, work, uh, I spent lots of time in the woods by myself. Now, I'm an airplane driver. I got about 8,000 hours of flying time about four each, military, four uh, civilian. Uh, of this military, at least one fourth of that time was by myself in an airplane. Have we ever discussed the, uh, what flying an airplane is like? 
hours and hours of boredom punctuated by a few seconds of stark terror. Right. <laughs> you sit there, and there's the world. <laughs> and you, you get you a place to think. Yeah. And so when you correlate all these things, that's what I, what led to me, me to see so very vividly that uh, people are looking at this thing of what goes on with life insurance to entirely backward. Right. That I could see easily your need for finance is way bigger than your need for uh, uh, death benefit. It should never have been called life insurance because that is not the major characteristic. It's obvious. You gotta have a lot more of that in order to produce the death benefit. But the magnitude of it uh, had never been examined. The problem out there again is right back to how people think and uh, the fact that there is not all that introspection. One more example and uh, we'll get off that subject, okay? Uh, we've got to go back to the Bible again. Uh, you know the story of uh, old uh, Paul, used to be Saul, uh, persecuting uh, the Christians and uh, so forth. Uh, the Pharisee of the Pharisees. Yeah. Wasn't nobody higher than him. He studied under Gamaliel. He had a PhD under Gamaliel. On the road to Damascus, he got the living daylight slapped out of him there and whatnot. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it took him 10 years of introspection to get his head screwed on right. 10 years. Now, consider what's going on out there in the minds of people about the banking business. They've got to go through, they've got to get inspired, they've got to go through the period of introspection and get their head screwed on right. I'm Robert Murphy. I'm an economist of the Austrian School of Economics. I am a member of the Nelson Nash Institute board. I've helped design the IBC Practitioner Program. With Carlos Lara, I wrote How Privatized Banking Really Works. And with Nelson and Carlos, I'm co-author of The Case for IBC. I'm also a senior fellow with the Mises Institute and research assistant professor with the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech. I was in Nashville, I, I was there for nine years, and at the time, I just get this email out of the blue from this guy, Carlos Lara, and he says he's using a study guide that I had written to a big fat economics book that Murray Rothbard had written, and he was, he was working on um, a presentation that he was giving to commercial bankers on how fractional reserve banking works, and Carlos just really wanted to make sure he you know, had his uh, ducks in a row. And he, he saw on the back of this study guide that I had written that I also was from Nashville. So he invited me over and I get over there. And then at some point, as we got to know each other better, he hands me Nelson's book and he says, hey, Bob, I want you to look at this thing. Tell me what you think, because this really you know made an impact on me. But he didn't say too much more about that. It was more of a an open-ended question. So I took it, I went home with it. And my initial reaction was along the lines of, this guy, Nelson Nash, sounds like a great guy. Like, you want to go have a beer with him? He's got a lot of wisdom. I just, I love, love him as a character. But sorry, there's like five things wrong with this book. Like seriously, you know, serious fundamental problems. And, and I'll be honest, if I didn't know who Carlos was and I didn't know who Nelson was, like if somebody had just mailed me that book, I would have put it aside and I would never would have come back to it. I just would have thought, nah, there's something weird there. But it was because I knew Carlos well at that point and trusted his judgment, and he thought so highly of this guy, Nelson Nash, and this concept that I stuck with it. I didn't just reject it. And the more I got to learn about how whole life insurance worked and more about what Nelson actually meant, it was like, okay, actually, there's only four things wrong with this concept. And then a lot more I learned, I was like, you know what, three things, right? I misunderstood that other piece. And, and then of course, you can see where this is going. It got whittled down to finally... I was sold and I was thinking, how come not everyone's doing this? This is obvious. So it was, it was that sort of thing. And I think the, the fundamental thing was that I didn't know how whole life worked. And then also that I, um, I misunderstood a lot of what Nelson was saying. And as Nelson would probably put it, like my training, you know, my PhD in conventional economics, I, you know, I just, it sort of made me think of it a certain way. And so that, that was, there was a paradigm shift that was necessary. The first few times you're reading Becoming Your Own Banker, it, it seems like a hodgepodge of ideas. Like what we're talking about flying an airplane, what we're talking about these bankers in Texas taking out money and bilking their shareholder. And 
and it, at first it just seems like these weird string of anecdotes or something, and then, but I realized the more I studied it, and especially hearing him give lectures and, oh, the function of that story is to teach this principle. And, and so just the more I got to understand it, it's like, okay, there, there really is a method here and he knows what he's doing. Some of the things that in becoming your own banker at first, I didn't understand and why it was hard for me to grasp. Cause gee, that's not the way I would have presented it, but he, he's not writing a textbook. He's certainly not writing something for an actuary. He's writing something to tell the general public, this is important. You need to look into this. This can change your life. And that's why the book was written the right way it was. The first time I met him, I was invited to be a speaker at what, the, what the, was called the think tank, the IBC think tank. And so I, I went down under those auspices. And the first time I saw, I was in a room with him is he was in the middle of giving his seminar. And I was, I was just really bl blown away. Like I said, cause yeah, I, you know, I'm a professor and I've seen people lecturing. I, I feel bad for people who are never gonna see him in action and they're just gonna be able to read about or hear people tell stories. Cause it really is something amazing to go. I mean, he just takes over a room and it's just, he's in charge. It's it's a mixture. He's he's telling stories, and they, but you you understand like, oh yeah, he could he could give a seminar for eight hours, and people are going to be sitting there, and they're not going to be twiddling their thumbs or saying, when's this thing going to be over? It was really impressive, just a string of a mixture of teaching principles that are kind of dry. I mean, he's sitting there telling people this is how you could use a life insurance policy. That doesn't sound like it's a very interesting thing, and yet he would intersperse it with personal anecdotes and, and such, and but be quizzing the audience and he would go around and, you know, uh, now, now Mary Love, what would you say about this? And then he just would bounce around and just make sure he's not losing people and get everyone involved. And it was, it was impressive to watch just in terms of him commanding the room, just as a, as, as a public speaker. And it was a, just a very unique style. Like I say, I, there's really no one else like him in that respect. I'm Carlos Lara. I'm a businessman. Uh, I'm also a uh, co-director uh, sitting on the board of the Nelson Nash Institute. I'm uh, the author of two books, uh, How Privatized Banking Really Works with Robert Murphy, and also co-author with our latest book, The Case for IBC with Nelson Nash and Robert Murphy. Uh, I'm also a co-creator of the uh, Authorized IBC Practitioner Program. I was actually, um, <clears throat> I was in, in, a, in someone's office. We were having a discussion, I can't remember what it was about, but I noticed the book sitting on this individual's desk. And it was the original book that Nelson had written. Doesn't look anything like what it does today, but the title of it is what caught my attention. Becoming Your Own Banker. You know, now, I didn't, I didn't know anything about this, and, but that title just, it wouldn't go away. So I asked the individual, uh, what's that book about? If, you know, he said, I have no idea, I haven't read it. He said, if you, you want it, go ahead and take it. And so, so he said, somebody gave it to me. And so I took it home, uh, began to read the book, and naturally, like most people, I was intrigued. There's, there was a lot of things in there that it just intrigued me, it puzzled me. So you have to remember that um, I've spent but basically four decades uh, working with businesses that get in serious financial trouble. Um, I do what is known, known as informal reorganizations, which is when a, a business falls in a situation where they run out of credit, they run out of cash, they're thinking very, seriously about filing for bankruptcy, and I try to reorganize our company outside of bankruptcy. And um, along the way, in order to, to help businesses raise capital, I actually became a broker-dealer, which is uh, uh, it's, it's a securities uh, specialist. I was a member of the National Association of Securities Dealers. And so I've gone through all of those licenses that you have to go through and whatever. So I understood Wall Street and its financial products. That was my background. And so the idea that you become your own banker really struck with me because anytime you're dealing with a financial crisis with businesses, there's a, there's a commercial bank involved and they're generally the secured creditor and everybody else is fighting <laughs> to just be able to come out with their shirts on their back. But when I picked up the book, I couldn't figure out 
you know, they're talking about, he's talking about banking, but at the same time he's talking about life insurance. So I just, you know, was wanting to know more. And, you know, Nelson had his uh, address and telephone number on the back of the book. And so I, you know, I called Nelson and uh, realized he lived just about three hours from me. And so set up an appointment, you know, to visit with him just to find out a little bit more uh, about his concept. One reading of this book won't do the job. Uh, it's got to, uh, to pique the imagination of a person and uh, they've got to go over and over and over it because there are things that you don't see at first because the more you see, the more you see you didn't see. In essence, infinite banking concept is ridiculously simple, but it's complicated by the fact of the uh, mindset that the general public has. They think that this is, can't be true because it uh, is so simple. The forces out there that cause all this sort of stuff deliberately make it that way. Uh, they intimidate you is what it amounts to. Well, you got to realize uh, what uh, what evil looks like, and that is evil that's going on out there. Uh, don't participate. That's all. Uh, you got to learn to secede from the way that the world thinks. Is what this amounts to. And when you do, you create a microcosm that's all yours. You've created an aquarium. Well, the most important word really is uh, probably concept. Uh, the others are modifiers. Now, uh, it involves the flow of money. It involves the warehousing of money. But uh, the more you see again, the more you see you didn't see. And so that's the reason for the word infinite. Uh, how do you describe infinite? You can't. When you define something, you put limits on something. Well, there's no way you can put limits on this. See, the idea that the banking function should be totally controlled at the ind individual level is a totally foreign idea to 99.9% .9 of the world. Yeah, I point out that there's on one, only one pool of money out there in the world, the fact that various and sundry banks, insurance companies, corporations, and individuals are managing a portion of that pool is incidental. It's just like uh, an analogy of, of water. Uh, this earth is covered by about over 75% of it is water. And the sun heats that stuff up, that causes um, some of it to evaporate in the atmosphere. That causes wind currents because moist air is lighter than dry air. And um, uh, it precipitates out in rain, sleet, snow, and hail. And somewhere or another, it's some of it's going to flow through you and me, otherwise we're dead. Uh, about 75 to 80% of you is water. We can't live without that. And it's got the flow. Well, the same sort of thing happens with uh, money out there. Uh, it's uh, got the flow. Otherwise, it's absolutely worthless. See, people, un they understand that, but yet when it comes down to a little simple thing like banking, uh, they lose all perspective. And it's all because of a mindset. And that mindset predominates out there. Fish are the last to notice the water. It's been going on for something like five to 6,000 years. And uh, you cannot break that cycle easily. You got to learn how to secede from it and realize that you do not have to play their game at all. All right, now when you don't play that game out there, it's a simple life, really. And it's very profitable compared with everything else because you see, so much of what we do in life out there has absolutely no function at all. It's just uh, excess baggage that we have to put up with because of the way that we don't, we don't think. And one of the easiest things to do is get rid of the bankers out there, don't be paying interest. It doesn't take all that long to really get started. When you get to my stage of life, that uh, uh, it's the best way in the world to pass the medium exchange on to the next generation. Uh, we had 49 policies at one time. We're down to 24 now. 
I've heard you say that at this stage in your life that you're in the process of giving things away. Yes, you can't take this stuff with you. Good grief. Since uh, I developed this concept and so forth and got uh, rid of the banks uh, and the indebtedness I owed them, uh, Mary and I and uh, Kim and Dave and their family, we haven't seen the bank in over 30 years. Everything is done within the, within the family. There's no mortgages, no uh, uh, car notes. There's no more financing of any kind. And that is a very peaceful, stress-free way of life. Well, it all begins with solving the banking equation at the UNB level to the point where you do not participate in anything that goes on out there that involves loans from any type of banking organization, including mortgages. There's no mortgage here. There's no mortgage over there or there. Uh, there's no mortgage uh, with my other two children at all. Days, uh, four kids and so forth. Uh, you know, that's four kids, that's eight automobiles, isn't it? Uh, nothing is financed outside the system. It's it's an aquarium again. Kim and Dave have been married, uh, let's see, 78, 79 was when they got married. First thing Dave had to do was buy a significant uh, life insurance policy. <laughs> I actually met Nelson at the airport in Honolulu, Hawaii, two days before the wedding yep. for, for the first time. <laughs> I was an Army lieutenant, so I was not uh, interested in any Southern uh, marriage rituals, you know, with the father venting the son-in-law and uh, all that stuff like that. I just wanted to get it over with. And so I proposed to, to Kim uh, and, and, and never asked for her hand in marriage like I should have, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because that wasn't part of the, the culture in Hawaii for single second lieutenants. <laughs> but anyway, I met, I met Nelson and his wife, Mary, and uh, Kim's grandparents and sister and brother-in-law at the airport. We picked them up at the airport a couple days prior to the, prior to the, uh, the wedding. And uh, after, after shaking hands and, and getting formal introductions out of the way, the first thing I remember was me signing a piece of paper <laughs> And uh, lo and behold, it was a, it was a whole life uh, insurance policy. <laughs> I, I think it was a hundred. First things first. First things. I, I think it was a hundred thousand dollar death benefit, and uh, I was like, I would, at that point, I would sign anything, okay. But uh, that was the first thing we I, I did was fill out my name and sign it, and uh, I'm sure he submitted it as soon as he got back to the states. Yeah. But um, that was the uh, that was the first thing on his mind, I think. So. Uh, that, you know, I, I had no idea, you know, what, what that would lead to, uh, but it was still, I mean, it was just the first of many, you know, so here we are. Never knew I'd be here today doing what I'm doing with Nelson, but my first time when I really, I got the message was you know, we, we lived in Montgomery, Kim and I, and that we had uh, four kids by then, and we were getting ready to move to Savannah, Georgia, and we were getting a conventional loan, so I needed to put down 20%. And of course, I didn't have any money because I was in the army, and all my disposable income was going to premiums. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so uh, we had to come up with with some cash, and so I, I we we asked Nelson if we you know how much uh, cash renter value we had. We could we had enough for I think it was a twenty thousand dollar down payment. He said, "Hey, no problem. You know, I'll, you know, we'll get you a check in the mail immediately." And then so I filled out the paperwork for the uh, the mortgage. And it was like, okay, uh, where did you get the $20,000 down payment for the house? And I was afraid to tell him where I got it because my thought was that if I was borrowing money for a down payment, then they disqualify me for a loan. Okay, so I was like, how do I get around this and not tell them that this is a loan that I'm using for a down payment? And so finally, it came down to well, it was a policy loan. He said, "Oh, that doesn't count. That's your that's an asset you own, so th that's fine." I went, "Really?" So it was like it was it was a check the block. I mean, it wasn't like going down to the bank and getting a loan. To, you know, you know, what I'm talking about. Right. So I was like, "Wait a minute, this is something. This is different." Welcome okay. In and, and this mortgage company, they, they treat it as a different asset yeah. than a loan. And that, so that was 1992. And that was the first time I really 
started looking at it differently, thinking about it differently after that. The uh, the longer I'm doing this, the, the IBC, the uh, the longer the more I see it from from a personal perspective. Ninety percent of the people still don't understand what it's all about. They think it's about insurance. All we're talking about is is creating a, a you know cash flow management system where you don't lose control of that cash flow. You buy policies as you can. You buy policies for reasons that you need to buy them for. Okay, if you have you have increased cash flow, then you can buy a policy. Okay, if you can afford it. Okay, if you have a you, you have a new grandson or granddaughter, there there's an opportunity to buy a new policy. Okay, to me it's it's a lifestyle. Okay, it's not a a, a financial plan. It's just a lifestyle. It's just part of living. Okay, just like everything else. I also shared that, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, that, that Kim and I bought Nelson and Mary's house back in 2010, and we, we tore it down and rebuilt it up. Uh, but that house was, was completely remodeled through policy loans, 100%, okay? And the way we designed the policy loans was we, we, we designed them like construction loans. Because every two weeks I get an invoice from the builder for about $20,000. They'd invoice me for what you know for materials and labor. It was a cost plus contract we did. So it was about a twenty thousand dollar invoice every two weeks. And so every two weeks we twenty thousand dollar policy loan. And it would take two or three days to cycle it and get it in the bank account. But so we had that set up. And so it was just a cash flow, you know, from from you know the policies to me to the construction company and back around again. So it was all over with. You know, we, we had that that uh, audit trail, and it's still you know. Unfortunately, the house is still uh, not paid for, you know, but guess what? The deed is in my, my possession, okay? I have a place for windfalls if I ever have an opportunity to get some. It will be. And, I, and, and, and we, we pay it as, as we can or want to. So that's, that's perfect peace of mind. So there's these two uh, Auburn guys uh, in school uh, they're discussing what they're going to take next session in school. One said, I just signed up for this new course that Auburn's offering in logic. His friend said, what's that? He said, look, I can learn a great deal about you in a relatively short period of time with just a few uh, questions and um, the use of logic. For instance, do you own a weed eater? And he says, yes. Well, logic tell me you're a homeowner. Yes. Well, logic tell me you might be married then. Yes. Well, logic tell me you might even have children. Yes, we have two. He said, well, uh, logic tells me that uh, you're heterosexual. Now, yes. You see, you see how it works now? Yes, I'm going to take that course too. He signed up. Talking with somebody a couple of days later, he says, I just signed up that new course, Auburn's often in logic. The other party says, well, what's that? <clears throat> he said, look, I can learn a great deal about you in just a few minutes with just a few basic questions and the use of logic. For instance, do you own a weed eater? No. Logic tell me you're probably homosexual. <laughs> You see, he took a little bit of information and he reached an absurd conclusion. Well, if there was ever a business out there that treated that way, it's life insurance. People take a little bit of information and they reach absurd conclusions. People keep thinking that life insurance is a product of the IRS code and it is not. In the USA, the uh, IRS code's only been around since 1913. The country is uh, oh, oh, about, what, what is it, 230 years old, something like that. Life insurance is older than the United States. Quite often, uh, people with, uh, quote, a large amount of uh, monetary value have a more difficult time catching on this than the everyday person. The everyday person can see uh, the uh, value of it and uh, start on the scale that's appropriate for them. And uh, it doesn't take long to uh, get rid of one of those indebtedness out there. And once you get that done, uh, it snowballs in a hurry. Like I said, it took me 13 years to get rid of the, uh, the banks. 
But so what? Uh, it's going 13 years is going to go by anyway. Uh, but once you get rid of this, it's such a different life. Shakespeare gave us a uh, clue years ago. He said, all the world is a stage and all the people are actors thereon. Uh, but my observation in the financial world, when it comes to uh, the, the subject of finance, they don't even know what the play is about. But worse than that, to get the characters in the play uh, mixed up. All right, now somebody's got to be the banker out there. What's happening with dividend pay and old life insurance? You got to pay uh, a premium. The life insurance company has got to put that money to work. They put it to work in various and sundry places. And in my book, I uh, point out that they uh, one of the places they put it is uh, shopping centers and um, uh, real estate developments and so forth. Another place they might put it to uh, work is um, mortgages, like house mortgages, residential mortgages, things of that nature. And another one is uh, that they do make it possible to lend money to you. In fact, if you read the contract, it tells you that you have uh, available 100% of what can be lent from your policy at any one time. Well, if that's true, which it is, it's uh, total control. Well, the life insurance company uh, really uh, is uh, your trustee. This is just like a trust agreement. A trust has a grantor. It has a trustee. It has a beneficiary. The grantor creates the trust. Up until that time, it did not exist. When you buy a life insurance policy, you're creating a new business from scratch that never existed. You put property into the trust, the trustee becomes the owner of that property. The trustee becomes the owner of that property. The trustee has got to put it to work to carry out the provisions of the trust. Well, he can lend it, uh, he can put it to work in any number of places, but one of the places he can put it to work is with the Grand tall. Look at the uh, financial statement of any life insurance company, and uh, it will sh uh, show you very plainly that it's an instrument that have a guaranteed payback schedule. I said guaranteed payback schedule. Now, that's not true of things called universal life. That's not true of things called variable life. But these are products of the brains of Harvard MBAs that uh, it won't hold up over a period of time. Well, you got to meet people where they are. You can't full speed this stuff at all. It's not an intellectual argument. It is not a statistical argument. The concept of banking is. Banking is. It's just that the uh, uh, people who have taken over the banking equation uh, have uh, polluted it all. And uh, the banking function should be at the UNB level totally. But that is a foreign idea to most people. They can't conceive of it at this particular time. You're going to have to ask them to think, and that's painful. There's conditions out there where uh, there's any number of people with college diplomas. Uh, they had never cracked a book since they got out of uh, college other than some trash novel of some sort. You know, I've arrived and so what do I need to learn more? And so when you've arrived, uh, you quit thinking and everything that you do is downhill. Uh, learning should be a uh, continuous process all of your life. Otherwise, uh, it's just not all that much of a life. And of course, uh, there's my mentor, Leonard Reed, uh, most educated man I ever met in my life. Uh, he had no degrees from anywhere. Neither did Henry Hazlitt, his co-founder of the Foundation for Economic Education. Neither did Herbert Spencer in years uh, in England years before that. And that was a time when uh, they had nowhere near the resources that we have out there today. Uh, so people have really no excuse, but they have some uh, erroneous ideas put into their minds. And that's the problem. It just doesn't have to be that way. And that's why they've got to learn to secede from the way the world thinks. 
So uh, that's the uh, real message of the arrival syndrome is when you quit searching out there, uh, that's just not good. That's all there is to it. Nelson, as of today, is 87 years old. Nelson's persona, I think, is is what really uh, got Infinite Banking where it is. His, his, you could tell his genuine passion for what he did and how he did it and why he did it. Both the insurance side of him, the Forrester side of him, and the Austrian side of him. Okay, so that persona, we think it's incred incredibly important to keep that whole package moving forward for the next generation. Okay, so instead of selecting individuals to do that, we, we're trying to create this entity that under the under the guidance of, of passionate direction, we'll keep it going, in the, you know, for, for your children, your grandchildren, and the next generation of insurance agents also. Because, you know, without a mutual insurance company or mutual holding company and trained life insurance agents, then how can you implement IBC without those, without those resources? So that that's what the NII is all about. We, we're trying to get it up and going and get the momentum, create, create that critical 10% tipping point as Malcolm Gladwell talks about, to keep it going and get the crest of the wave going. Well, when I figured all this out uh, about 35 years plus ago, uh, I saw that uh, this uh, had to be uh, taught out there and uh, it can't be taught top down. I tried that um, tack and it was a miserable failure. And I thought academia was a way to get it taught and that was even worse. And so, I saw that it had to be done at the you and me level, and I also saw that I'm not going to live forever, that uh, I needed to uh, find uh, people that would grasp this and take the baton and go. As time went by, um, uh, here was this guy named Carlos Lara that uh, uh, got interested in this, and uh, he didn't catch on immediately. It took a while, so, <laughs> in which he readily admits but uh, I guess he's got the most thorough uh, understanding of this of anybody I know. And uh, I've always uh, tried to get this across to my Austrian friends, but they're too busy with uh, whatever they were pursuing, and uh, I, I never could get their attention at all. And uh, Carlos Lara, uh, somehow or another, uh, got up with a guy named Bob Murphy that lived there in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm an academic economist. I wasn't from uh, the financial sector per se. I immediately took to Nelson because he was into Austrian economics. Leonard Reed had been his mentor, so we had that that bond in that respect. And the the crucial link was I was in Carlos Lara's kitchen and he was telling me that, hey, Bob, you know, the Austrians, what you guys are doing, going around warning the public about Federal Reserve policy and how we really need to return to sound money and this is what, what causes the business cycle. That's all great, but there's no, there's nothing the public can do about it except, you know, maybe buy some gold and, and try to pass books around to your friends and neighbors and we got to change public opinion, which I still believe in ultimately changing public opinion is crucial, but that's a very long-term project. And what Carlos was telling me is then we got what Nelson's teaching people, IBC, becoming your own banker. And I said, yep. And so at that moment, I still thought those were two separate things. I was able to tell Bob that uh, what the Austrians had always wanted was to you know, bring money and banking back to the private sector, that Nelson's IBC was a way to actually do privatized banking and that yeah, based on Nelson's idea, anyone can do this. You know, there was nothing to hold them back. We didn't have to wait until government changed laws and all of this that the Austrians knew would take a long time to do. Nelson had a way with his idea to, to bring privatized banking to the individual immediately and sort of secede from the system. And it really hit me. I was like, whoa, every household or business that implements IBC is an effect that's a form of privatized banking, that they're moving towards a private banking system that the Austrians are painting as the vision for society. And in retrospect, that's made sense that Nelson always talked about how, you know, that Austrian economics was the backbone of what he was doing. And so then Carlson and I wrote our book, How Privatized Banking Really Works where we're trying to integrate Austrian economics and IBC. Bob and I continued to work uh, 
We were making presentations uh, to audiences, and we were not yet formally connected with Nelson. And we had begun trying to bring the book alive by uh, having a conference in, we, in which we would join together uh, Austrian speakers from the Austrian school on one day, and then on the second day, we would talk to audiences about the infinite banking concept. And we called that event the Night of Clarity. We also put Nelson on the stage because Nelson has been an Austrian for 60 plus years. Nelson Nash and, and his son-in-law David Stearns uh, uh, really liked the Night of Clarity and that it was truly now uh, integrating, you know, uh, the infinite banking concept with the Austrians. And they, they liked that, that marriage very much. Because of that, so th there were uh, prof financial professionals who were setting their clients up with IBC type policies. And Carlson and I started getting invited out to these events to speak. But the, the problem was once we moved beyond, you know, once we, we started getting more popular on the speaking circuit, if you want to describe it like that, we started moving beyond financial professionals that Nelson knew personally or David Stearns knew personally and could tell us, yeah, those are good guys and they, they know what they're doing. What we realized is that we'd get on a plane, do a presentation, uh, we'd leave, and we really didn't know these financial professionals well. We, 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 did, we didn't know what they were selling the audience there. And so as IBC was growing in popularity, we were also seeing that there was um, a lot of um, life insurance policies that were not working well because they were the wrong kind of life insurance policies. And so if you went to the internet, you saw a lot of um, information there that was calling IBC a scam. People shouldn't get involved with it. We became concerned that because we were seeing there was a lot of people that claim to understand what IBC is and how it works, and, uh, and we had no way of knowing that. And so um, we began thinking very seriously uh, with Nelson and David about how to fix that. And so that was one of the main reasons for um, coming together and, and forming what's now called the, the Nelson Nash Institute and establishing the, um, the the practitioner program where we design a course for financial professionals to go through. And one of the, the elements of that, one of the, the goals was that now I can, with comfort and confidence, continue teaching the public about IBC. And then when someone says, okay, so what do I do now? I can point them and say, go to the graduates of our practitioner program. Well, one thing that comes out uh, is that whenever you speak to people and you see that they're beginning to understand IBC and what it's about, and they'll say, I wish I had started doing this years ago. And that is the way we all feel. Wish that we had started doing this years ago. And so Nelson was, in his bright mind, was able to look beyond life insurance to see what was there and how important it was and that it needed to be uh, passed on to the next generation. And that's why he, you know, he had so many dividend paying whole life policies, you know, he, up to 47, I believe, and he bought them on every time a child was born, he would buy them because he wanted those children to know what uh, the infinite banking was about with the idea that should learn what it is and continue to use it. And as he, you know, often says, they'll never see a bank in their life. And so this is very important to be able to pass it on to the next generation. And each one of us that, that, that do this, that take this process on for ourselves, almost have that obligation to make sure that our children and our grandchildren children know about it. We'll never get the mission done without the intellectual community. That's all there is to it. And Bob Murphy is the key to it. If there's anybody that understands it uh, totally, it's Bob Murphy out there. And he's the key to uh, the intellectual community.
Well, uh, fortunately, my uh, youngest daughter married well, a guy named David Stearns, and uh, of course, uh, he wasn't all that enthused about buying life insurance when he first uh, married my daughter, but uh, that was the only way we get done. <laughs> so he was a slow learner too, but uh, there's no better practitioner of the concept out there than David Stearns. And so if there's anything that gives me uh, real joy uh, at this late stage in life today is that uh, those three guys are uh, everything I ever dreamed of. Uh, at one time, I was president of the Chamber of Commerce. Well, that meant that uh, I got to uh, select the speaker for the annual meeting. Well, being an airplane driver, I picked William Piper, Piper Aircraft Company. One of the messages he got uh, across to our group was, he says, uh, you have a telephone, big deal. If somebody else doesn't have a telephone, you don't have a thing. You may have the best message in the world. You may have the best delivery system in the world. You may have the best technique in the world. But if you don't have a receptive listener, you don't have a thing. Well, uh, the book's done rather well. It's in 31 countries and changed the lives of lots and lots of people. So. It's pretty gratifying uh, to have them call and say, you changed my life. I said, no, I didn't change your life. You saw something of value and you changed. So the magic out there is that people see this vision and catch on. Blinking Lights Award takes its name from a moment that I will never forget, a very personal moment in November of 1986. I was in Poland at the time and spending time with people who were active at that time in the anti-communist underground. And one evening, a couple was introduced to me. They had run an underground radio during martial law in Poland that was broadcasting a message of freedom for their country. And I asked them at one point, I said, how did you know when you were broadcasting if people were listening? And Sophia answered and she said, we wondered that ourselves. We could only broadcast for eight or 10 minutes at a time. And then we had to go off the air, tear down the radio, go someplace else, set it up again, broadcast another eight or 10 minutes, hoping to stay a step ahead of the government. And she said, but one night we asked people while we were broadcasting, if you believe in liberty for Poland, the message of this radio. Will you please blink your lights? And she then told me, we went to the window and for hours, all of Warsaw was blinking. <laughs> and the Blinking Lights Award for Nelson Nash reads as follows. The Blinking Lights Award from the Foundation for Economic Education recognizes R. Nelson Nash with deep appreciation for a lifetime of advocacy, inspiration, and achievement on behalf of liberty and sound banking. Congratulations, Nelson and Mary. me to say a very few words. For those who know me, uh, I usually talk eight hours at a time. <laughs> I will try to restrict myself. But folks, you have no idea what a joy it was to know Lyndon Reed as your personal friend and mentor. I first got acquainted with FEE in 1957. Uh, I started telling everybody about the organization everywhere I went. I first met him personally in 1966, I believe it was. And so it has been a passion since that time. You have no idea 
how valuable an instrument you have in FEE. Folks, Leonard wrote for a busy people. You could pick up any one of his books. Uh, it doesn't matter which one. You could read any chapter in about 15 minutes. Now, once you got through that, you could chew on that information for at least a week because it was that valuable and that intense. So please take my advice there. Get that stuff and study it. Uh, it will bless your life. You see, if it weren't for Leonard, we wouldn't be here. That's my candid appraisal. See, I've known lots of economists all down through the last uh, 61 years. And working with economists is about like trying to herd cats. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard had that ab ability to work with these people and to uh, form such an organization as FEE. That took special talent. So uh, you have a heritage that you wouldn't believe from this great man. Thank you for your intense interest in, in the, the mission of FAE, and let's spread the word. Let's blink lights. I remember the first time uh, that I actually uh, was talking to an audience about Nelson Nash. I, I said, you know, I held up his book, and I said, you know, only an Austrian could have written this book. The day I was reading it, I knew it, that there was something Austrian about it. And of course, Nelson's been an Austrian economist for many, many years, so I love that about him. I love the fact he's an Austrian. He has a lot of courage to speak his mind. And so I respect that about him. He's been a great person to follow. I'm amazed that at age 88, his mind is still as sharp as it can be. And um, he still wants to be in the middle of this movement. You know, he, you know, and, and I, he's, it's amazing. I mean, he's just a great role model to have. I don't mind saying that I adore the man. He's, a, he's just a great man. Nelson's definitely served as a role model for me and things I've, I've tried to copy his example. One element is his willingness to, to speak about his Christian faith, even in a financial setting. That permeates who he is. That's something I've, I've definitely um, learned from him is, is that you, know, you, you really don't hide who you are and if you believe something, and that's of course the most important thing in what we believe and, and to share that. And, and Nelson, he's still always learning. And I've even seen him incorporate things over time such that w when others would hear him saying it, they might've thought, oh yeah, that's probably some principle or aphorism he's been repeating since 1967. But I know, oh no, that one, he just started doing that three months ago. And, and so it's interesting that he, it's not that he's just, he was who he was back in 1985 and now he's just repeating the same old things. He is still learning to this day. We have video conferences to keep in touch and he'll hold up a new book and talk about, oh, I'm reading this, and, and he's reading more books than I am. And it's really impressive just to see what a, what a, what a scholar he is. And so that's, that also just inspires me that, that yes, that it's, you don't wanna get a rival syndrome, as, as he would say, you wanna just always be learning. In terms of me knowing other academics and intellectuals, there's, there's really no one I've ever met like him. And, and once you get to meet him and you take it for granted, but occasionally I'll remind myself and say there's this, guy Nelson Nash out there and look at all these things he did and he wrote this book that is you know, being translated in other languages and all these people are just changing their lives and it's it's so he, he really has had a huge impact because he, he discovered something that really it's it's true and it's important and it also can can change things and so there's a lot of academics who come up with a great idea that's interesting and people might tell others just because oh look at this this is a nice way to look at the world but it doesn't lead to anything. And then there's also a lot of people who are doers, you know, men of action, but they're not very thoughtful or intellectual, and Nelson's both, that he's a scholar, but he also gets things done. So I, I would say that that's a, a fairly unique combination. What do you want the world to know about your husband, R. Nelson Nash? Well, I think first and foremost that he's a Christian and that he loves the Lord with all his heart, mind, and soul. 
and he loves his wife and his children and uh, all of his family, and that he's a man of honor and grace. So over the last 17 years, I've probably spent more time with Nelson than anybody, right? Yeah, true. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I know him better even my, than my, my own father. So I've, I've probably learned more about life from you than anybody else. Our, I think our relationship is somewhere between a father and son and best friends than anything else. Does that, how do you feel about that? Totally, thank you. You're welcome. So, you have no idea. Thank you. You're welcome. I love you. Love you, son. And we'll miss you. Yeah. In his book, he quotes the statement that says, uh, plan as if you're going to live forever and live as if you're going to die today. And so I, I like to think of that when I think of him. <laughs>